Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If everybody wants to find a seat, feel free to come up. We've got some you know, front row tables available. Don't be shy. Uh, hopefully, everybody's had a chance to grab some breakfast. Perfect. So my name is Eamon Siddiqui. Good morning, everybody. I am a member of the LBJ Future Forum board, and we're hosting this event. And I'm so excited to welcome you this morning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Future Forum and, and what we do here, and then I'll introduce our fantastic panel today to get started. So the Future Forum is dedicated to advancing meaningful policy conversations. We're an initiative of the LBJ Presidential Library where we host bipartisan discussions, networking opportunities, and events that inspire thoughtful political dialogue in Austin. Our mission is to foster civil, informed, and balanced discussions on some of the biggest issues of our time. And I'm excited because on November 19th, we're excited to welcome Ambassador Geraldine Byrne Nason, Ireland's ambassador to the US as a part of our Women in Leadership series. So put that on your calendar. Hope to see you all there. For those of you who aren't members yet, I encourage you to join us. The Future Forum members enjoy first access to events, networking opportunities, happy hours, and exclusive perks at the LBJ Library. So let's talk about what we're here for today. Today's program is especially important as we sit in the LBJ Presidential Library, home to our 36 President's Archives. President Johnson had been a firm supporter of the US space program when he was a senator, when he helped draft and enact the legislation that became the National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958. Uh, as Vice President, when he served as the Chairman of the National Aeronautics and Space Council and hired the first NASA Administrator, and as President, by supporting the Project m mission and later the Apollo space missions, including Apollo 8, the final manned mission of the Johnson presidency. Today, we're honored to host Vanessa Weich, the director of the NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, my home. <laughs> Under Director Weich's leadership, the Johnson Space Center, a hub of innovation with over 11,000 employees, has become a national model in human spaceflight, low Earth orbit commercialization, and deep space exploration. Fun fact, the Johnson Space Center was recognized by Forbes as Texas's number one best employer two years running, and is also the best place to work in the federal government. Moderating today's discussion is Gwen Griffin, CEO of Griffin Communications Group and chair of the Texas Space Commission Board of Directors. Gwen is a renowned figure in the space industry, having collaborated with some of the biggest names in space and aeronautics, including NASA, Blue Origin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and many more. We'll have time for questions at the end, so please hold on to those. And now I'm thrilled to hand things over to Gwen. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Eamon, really appreciate you being here, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, what an honor for me to be able to host this chat with Lyndon B. Johnson, NASA, Center Director, Vanessa Weich. I have to say that Vanessa um, is an exceptional leader, an incredible space strategist, and an all-around fantastic human being. What better combination um, for someone to lead the NASA Johnson Space Center right here in Texas? So with that, Vanessa, thank you for being here today and for letting me host this conversation. I'd well, like to thank you. Thank you, Gwen, for hosting. And then also, I, I do want to thank the Futures Forum uh, for inviting us to be a part of this. And uh, full disclosure, Gwen and I have, have known each other. Uh, we both served on the board of Space Center Houston uh, as uh, advisors. And we both have a very, very, very strong affinity for STEM. And um, so I really appreciate uh, the relationship that we've had. Uh, and the things that we've done over the years. Oh gosh, thanks, <laughs> very nice. And yes, we both have that passion for seeing the next generation. And many of you here in the room, I hope you represent that next generation. And uh, for all, thank you for your encouragement to inspire, prepare, and employ that future workforce. So, so with that, I'd like to start with a few questions about your position. Um, many likely wonder what does the director of one of NASA's largest centers actually do? <laughs> um, and so can you tell us a little bit about your role at NASA as a federal agency and your responsibilities at JSC? 
So um, the role of the director uh, is really making sure that uh, all of the uh, efforts that we have ongoing happen and that they are successful in our case because we put humans in space. It's making sure that they are safe and that they are effective. So uh, right now, today, we have astronauts that are in space this weekend. Uh, I, sp I spent my weekend welcoming home uh, astronauts that were coming home and making sure that they got back to Houston safe and sound. Uh, so that requires me uh, to have readiness reviews uh, to make sure that uh, our, our, if we're working with a commercial company, uh, we have insight into what they're doing. Uh, so I have relationships with all of those companies to uh, make sure that we have a, a clear understanding of what the roles that they have, that they've completed their work, and that we're ready to go for our missions. So that's the kind of a tactical overseeing. And then from a strategic standpoint, uh, it's working every day to make sure that our workforce has their resources to be able to be good at their jobs. Uh, and so uh, working with our congressional uh, members, working with the folks that are at NASA headquarters, you know, we do have uh, a part of being uh, in the executive uh, branch. Uh, we get our, our funding uh, through uh, the executive branch, but Congress actually does the funding. So having relationships and talking with uh, all of those stakeholders uh, to make sure they understand what our requirements and needs are at the Johnson Space Center. And then uh, it's working here in the state of Texas. Uh, and so I'm very proud of the relationships that we do have in the state of Texas. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more, but uh, now the, you know, the governor stood up a space commission. Uh, they're setting an overall strategy. And so from Johnson's standpoint, uh, we want to see uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center and Texas to continue to be the hub for human space exploration. So there's lots of activities that are going on, but how do we make sure that the work uh, that we have been doing continues well into the future? And that's by connecting uh, with others that are thinking about what the plans are for the state of Texas. So those are just some of the things in my day job, Gwen. <laughs> I could go on because there's managing a, a facility that has acres and acres of land, numbers of buildings, and uh, a workforce of um, you know in the thousands. Uh, there's also the the daily you know there's a water leak in this building. You got to make sure somebody gets over there to, to take care of that water leak. So there's also those little things that are happening every day as well. So as a follow on. If there were, and I, I know this is probably a silly question in some ways, but if there were an average day for the center director at the Johnson Space Center, what does that look like? I mean, talking about your position and, and your path, what, is there an average day? I No, there's yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. There's not, there's not an average day, but I would say on a, on a weekly basis, you know, my, my path is I spend... Uh, I would say about you know 25% of my time um, working through technical issues. I spend probably another 25% of my time thinking and working with others on overall strategies, and probably about half of the time uh, with my direct reports. So, um, so we'll maybe get a, an opportunity to talk about all the things that we're doing. But right now we have people in what we call low Earth orbit. So we have an International Space Station. It's a platform for science and technology research. Uh, and then we also have been working and doing missions going towards our Artemis program. And so spend about half of my time working with uh, what we call program managers, people that have the in-depth day-to-day responsibilities for running those programs, but working across all of those individuals to uh, make sure that we are completing all of the milestones that we have. Uh, so for the International Space Station, I'm very, very proud. Uh, we're about to celebrate having a platform where we have humans living off of this planet for 24 years. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it's a big deal. Yeah, I want to ask you and, a little bit. Um, and so, uh, you know, you guys probably see Mission Control. You see our, our teams that are working uh, on a daily basis to, to uh, make sure that those uh, efforts are ongoing, uh, but they're thousands and thousands of people that are in uh, what we call back rooms that are doing plants, that are doing uh, making it 
uh, possible for us to train. We have to train our astronauts. We have to develop uh, all of the things that they use and go into space. Uh, you see us doing, we call them uh, spacewalks, uh, going outside of the International Space Station sometimes to uh, keep the platform maintained. Uh, and then uh, if you uh, think about right now, we just had a hurricane uh, uh, major hurricanes that in the U.S. We had Burl in Texas, we had Helene, uh, we had uh, Milton, uh, but we use uh, sensors that are external to that platform uh, to study the effects, not only just of, of climate, but we also help uh, with the recovery efforts uh, as well. So just there's just a multitude of things yeah. that go on. Uh, so no, there's no real average day, but but if I sliced my, my weeks, uh, that's pretty much how I would bucket it. Oh, that's great. Wow. Just a few little things happening, like, you know, <laughs> helping to monitor and manage, you know, uh, hurricane and preparedness and recovery. So NASA overall, will you share a bit about our nation's goals um, in space and what are NASA's priorities today? We've talked about low Earth orbit a little, and I'm going to dig into that a little bit here in a bit. Yeah. So so NASA's, NASA's priorities today... Um, well, I would say first and, and foremost, um, if you were to, uh, to talk to our administrator, um, the priorities are what we call our exploration, uh, and that's the Moon to Mars programs. And the reason for that is uh, we're taking what we're learning in low Earth orbit, which is, a sec which is our second priority, but we're taking what we're learning there and we're applying it to deep space exploration for science discovery, we're also doing that for exploration goals in and of themselves, but also for diplomacy purposes. Uh, so with the Artemis program right now today, we have, I believe we signed about our 46th country that has signed up uh, to be a part of Artemis. So with the International Space Station, we have um, industry, uh, government uh, uh, institutions that are a part of the International Space Station. So. Uh, we have the Japanese, we have uh, the Europeans, uh, have a conglomerate, a European space agency, we have the Canadians, uh, and uh, we also uh, do uh, work with uh, Roscosmos, with, uh, with the Russians, uh, as a part of that. Um, now what we're doing, we're expanding the people that are part of that uh, effort. And so we have been adding uh, uh, South American countries, we've been adding more European countries, uh, we've been adding uh, Middle East, uh, so that we can have a peaceful way for us to collaborate in space. Uh, we do have other countries uh, that are doing things in space, and um, we want to make sure that there is a way for there to be a, um, a group of people that are focused on using space for, for peaceful, peaceful purposes. Uh, so. One of the, those priorities is, is that, is for, for diplomacy. Uh, and so with uh, Artemis, we are planning going to the moon. Uh, this time when we go to the moon, we're doing it under, um, I would say looking at it from a more sustainable way. With Apollo, uh, we did missions that were short duration missions. Uh, we did learn a lot and we advanced technologies here on Earth. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to go and we're going to have uh, what we call in-situ resource utilization. So that's learning to take the resources that are there on the moon and apply those so that uh, we can then stand up like mining. Uh, there are uh, companies uh, right here in Texas that are looking at how do you uh, develop and get the resources of the moon uh, so that they can make them from an economic standpoint. So the what we're doing today is building then a, an economy. And so there's Artemis, there's low Earth orbit, and then there's commercialization of space. And then of course, science is always a part of all of those goals. And so those are the main priorities. So this low Earth orbit economy that we've been working on and we have companies in Texas that are thriving at it. And then we have companies now uh, that have been working on uh, some of the efforts that we have for going to the moon. And at NASA's Johnson Space Center, we have responsibility for uh, commercialization of low Earth orbit, 
and we have uh, the lead on many of the efforts that we have for going to the moon as well. That answers what was my next question, is kind of where does JSC fit in that NASA ecosystem? And I think you just nailed it there. So, wow, a lot going on. And um, so let's talk a little bit more about LEO, as we call it in the industry, which is low Earth orbit. Um, and you might even tell folks what is low Earth orbit. And then um, what's happening, what's going on on the station today, now, um, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's next, but what are we doing on the space station today? Okay, so uh, first let's talk, talk about what is low Earth orbit, so, so the Earth, and so about 250 miles uh, above the Earth is where the International Space Station is. And so it's, a, it's at a actually good place to be able to observe the Earth, right? And uh, so we have um, the ability, as I mentioned, we have sensors that are doing that, but on the um, space station itself, uh, it's, it is a working laboratory. And so we do everything from life science experiments, materials experiments, uh, other technology advances. Uh, some of the things that we use it for today, especially around uh, life science research um, um, today, um, looking at uh, drugs. And we have uh, companies uh, that many uh, of the medical uh, companies have their own experiments that they're working on. Uh, one uh, that's uh, just very uh, promising for, uh, for me, I'm also a part of an effort called the Cancer Moonshot. And so um, we are uh, using the International Space Station not only for the development and looking at uh, new pharmaceuticals that can be used, but also uh, for uh, the delivery. And so if you think about it, uh, patients that have to undergo like chemotherapy uh, treatments, they have right now today uh, long infusion processes that so can take hours. Uh, but we are using the International Space Station, there's a company that is almost on the brink of having a cancer uh, drug that can just be like, you know, like shot, you know, subcutaneously wow. into your arm. Yes. And is that, can you talk a little bit about microgravity being an environment that enables more Right, it, en it enables that because you don't have gravity pulling on the cells, and so you can grow your cells in a different way and actually do the experiments that way. Uh, and so it, that is going to be so big of a fundamental shift, and it's going to you know, really make a major change in how we treat cancer in this country. Um, that, that's just one example. We're able to grow heart cells and yeah. other types of cells because we don't have, again, gravity that's pulling on them. And so that's allowing researchers to figure out ways to actually grow uh, organ tissues uh, for um, replacements if you needed to have like a, a, a transplant. Um, well, that hits close to home, right? Yeah. A lot of people say, why do we go to space when we have right. so many challenges here on Earth? And But to get uh, to the International Space Station today, uh, we're very, um, you know, thankful that uh, we now have U.S. capabilities again. Um, I actually, uh, most of my career at uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center, I, I was a part of the space shuttle. And uh, so when we retired the space shuttle, uh, we did not have a way for U.S. transportation. And so as a part of uh, efforts that we had been building up to, using uh, commercial companies first to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. So uh, SpaceX, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, have been uh, doing that from a commercial standpoint for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then in 2020, uh, SpaceX uh, was um, the first US company uh, to provide our um, astronauts uh, to be able to have transportation to the International Space Station. Yeah, And that has been wonderful for us because, you know, relying on other countries for that um, was, was not a good position to be in. Yeah. Uh, so um, we're, we're very thankful right now today. We're, we're working with Boeing, uh, with the Starliner. Uh, they uh, have had two uncrewed uh, test flights and then this summer uh, they had one uh, crewed mission. And, I, you know, I, I want to talk about it because I want people to sure. understand that, you know, when we test um, hardware, um, you know, there's always going to be challenges. Most times people don't know all of the different challenges that we're dealing Space with. Space is hard. It, <laughs> you'll hear that a lot. It is. It is. And so um, we were, um, we had some challenges with the propulsion system that we 
uh, needed to work through and decided that because of the, the risk, uh, we decided to not return our astronauts. However, that capsule did land uh, in New Mexico uh, safely. And uh, so we are um, working with Boeing so that we can continue because we wanna have a redundant capability so that we're not uh, just reliant on one source. And that's why it's so very important for us to have um, the Starliner to be successful. Speaking of that, can you talk a little bit about not only how we get to the International Space Station, but what's the future of the ISS like and what's, what's ahead? Okay, so, um, and as Gwen said, there's, there's a lot going on in space and there's a lot going on in, uh, really in human, in human space flight in particular. So the International Space Station, uh, we have agreement uh, with our um, congressional uh, um, delegations that we would continue until 2030. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, they are the ones that, that fund us. And so uh, that's where we are today. So right now it's uh, 2024, about to be 2025. And so we know that what we've been doing with the International Space Station, as I mentioned, the things that we're learning, we want to continue uh, to have a platform that is in what we call this low, low Earth orbit location. The reason is it, it's very, uh, depending on orbital dynamics, we can get there in like four to six hours, right? It's 250 miles. Going to the moon is 250,000 miles. <laughs> and it takes, you know, uh, three days to get there. And we eventually want to get to Mars, right? It takes months to get to Mars. So having this platform uh, in low Earth orbit allows us to be able to do things, test things out, learn things uh, quicker than if we were trying to go all the way to the moon or go all the way uh, to Mars to figure things out. Uh, so what we've been doing is uh, working with commercial companies that want to develop their own space stations. And uh, so that's one of the other responsibilities um, at NASA's Johnson Space Center is working with those companies. Yeah. And uh, so the intent would be they will have their own space stations. NASA would still send our astronauts. We would send our experiments, things that we want to test and learn for, for deeper space exploration purposes. And then uh, those companies would be um, reaching out to other companies and having uh, other research that's done, other commercial astronauts uh, that would go uh, to those space stations. And so because we know that we have to end by 2030 with our International Space Station. And why we, is that? Why well, people might wonder, well, why? Well, again, it's, it's, it is a, it's a, um, uh, I would say it's, a, it's because of the funding, but uh, so we started building that platform, and the first elements were launched in 2000. So a long right. time ago. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, in 1998 were the first, wow. the first elements that were launched. And so because you, you know, think of your, your car, right? Yeah. At some point, it's going to uh, need to um, not be useful, right? Yeah. You can repair it. You can change the oil. You can change all the parts. And that's what we've been doing. And when I tell you these maintenance and things that we do on it, but at some point it will uh, go past its useful life yeah. and we will have to deorbit that particular space station. And we are working on those plans right now today that when we, I was telling you about, you know, working strategy. So what is the strategy for deorbiting it so that it does not come and crash and uh, hit anyone here on earth? That's an important thing. Uh, <laughs> and then making sure that we have another platform that's ready. So we've been working with these companies now for, for a few yeah. years on what their plans are. And so many of them are at what we call a preliminary design phase. Some of them a little bit ahead, some of them a little bit more behind, but they're all kind of working to trying to reach a 2028 milestone. Okay. That's what they're trying to get to. So that if they can then have their platforms up, and running by 2028, of course, we know, as I said, there's gonna always be some issues that come up. So if we give them a 2028 target and they make 2029, 20, 2030, then that's good. And so that's okay. kind of what we're working towards so that we don't wanna have a gap. We want all of these people, uh, right now on, this, on the space station, I would say there's probably about three to 400 different scientific experiments that are going on. Wow. 
So we want all of those people that are doing their research. So thank you if you're a researcher and you're about right on the crux and finding this new discovery. You want to make sure you got somewhere else yeah. to go. So we're trying to make sure that we have a smooth transition so that we can move them over uh, to these other platforms. So the gaps about helping us here on Earth. I mean, yes. what we're doing on the space Absolutely. station. So we don't Absolutely. want that gap. Yes in and there and so important to try the best we can technology and launching and building in space is not easy it's not like me going out to the garage and taking a hammer and nail to some pieces of wood but yeah so that's the importance of timing so a lot of what you're doing strategy wise too is looking at capability ability and figuring out how to put the puzzle together right and so when we talk about that so so you know public policy yeah right? Uh, so there are discussions right now of, uh, so when we ended the space shuttle, uh, there was a decision that was, it was fine for the U.S. to have a gap and not to have access for uh, civilians to space. And because it was said, oh, it's only going to be three or four years, no big deal. Well, it ended up being almost 10 years. Yeah. So from a policy standpoint, uh, I think it's important for us to have a policy that says we do not want to have a gap. We want to have assured access for the U.S. to space. It's a great term, assured access to space here in the U.S. Yeah. So I'm going to hop and then come back to Artemis a little bit more because mm -hmm. it's so exciting. But let's talk a little more about the commercialization of space. Um, obviously, it's really gaining traction. I remember, um, I thought when wheels stopped on the space shuttle program, as we say in the industry, when wheels stopped in 2011, I thought to myself, okay, I'm moving toward that late career phase for myself. And it's like, will I ever see these incredible things happening in space? And let me just say, wow. I feel like um, I have the privilege of a dad that worked at NASA in the early days, and I saw, I didn't realize until I was an adult that they, what they were pioneering back during Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, um, and beyond. And now I look at where we are, and I think this is a really, really cool time to be um, in this industry. And that's, I think, one of the reasons we're so passionate about finding that next generation workforce. There's a lot of need in that workforce. But with the commercialization of space really gaining traction, can you tell us more about, you talked about policy, and that's what I want to hit on on a few questions here. The public-private partnership model that NASA has developed with commercial space companies, because that's new. Mm -hmm. It's very different than what it was like back, you know, your your father's Buick, you know, kind of thing back in the day. It, it's difficult for me to sit here and have Gwen say, oh, my dad worked at NASA back in the day. Her dad, hello, <laughs> <laughs> was a, a flight director for Gemini and Apollo and uh, had led uh, us through uh, many, many challenges and uh, getting this International Space Station that I'm talking about. Uh, making it happen, and he was a uh, previous director of the Johnson Space Center. And I will tell you, for me, uh, being a director, I don't have to do this job all by myself. I have great people like her dad that I can call oh. on any at any time to get advice. So um, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank that. Thank you. Off topic, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud. He's just not any old guy. Well, but, <laughs> but I look at what they did and, and I, I look at the age and the youth and it's, it, we're, we're back in just such yes. an exciting time, but it's different. Yes. And it's different it, because we're truly commercializing many yeah. of these things that were always government led. So yeah. what does that look like? It can't you know, be for easy me, every day. To it, <laughs> it, it's about transformation, right? Okay. So I, I think about, you know, NASA and how it's transformed. It's transformed uh, from being an agency that, you know, had, had one mission, yeah. which was Apollo, and, and that was the one thing. And then, you know, we decided that uh, we were going to go and we were going to do the space shuttle. Yeah. And we used the space shuttle to build the space station. So we kind of only kind of had this one thing, right? And now with all of the commercial stuff, we're doing multiple things and we're doing them all at the same time. I cannot tell you what it was like in 2022 to be in mission control and to have one uh, control room 
that was working on the International Space Station and keeping all the things that were going on there. And then the other, the other control room down the hall that was working on Artemis One and Orion and testing out. And here is this spacecraft that's going uh, to the moon. So I literally, images and, and telemetry is being sent to the moon and mm -hmm. to low Earth orbit at the same time. And that's really what is, is, is the commercial is enabling. Okay. And because what we're able to do is to say, okay, if we can get our services for our astronauts to um, low Earth orbit through companies, then that frees up dollars for NASA to spend a little more money than trying to do deeper space exploration and working with the internationals, which is very different, yeah. right? 40, and so did you say 46 countries? 46 countries have now wow. signed those accords. But now you have uh, agreements that they're providing elements. So we're not having to, pro you, you know, we as U.S. taxpayers are not having to provide all of these elements. We now have these international uh, countries that are providing elements. And then you think about now truly commercial things, right? right? That don't want to have any uh, partnership funds. Maybe they can do it completely on their own. We have some uh, billionaires yeah. <laughs> that can do that. And so, you know, they're coming in with their ideas. And so then NASA's role becomes, how do we help to enable public-private partnerships how do we share our tech, technical expertise? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we mm -hmm. uh, share the facilities that we have? You know, not everyone is going to want to build a huge uh, vacuum chamber that's the size of this room. It is very costly to be able to do that. And so right now, today, what we're doing is enabling uh, testing of what we call uh, government-owned capabilities mm -hmm. as well as commercial capabilities. Uh, you guys may have seen SpaceX um, recently had a um, commercial spacewalk, mm -hmm. and uh, they had an astronaut go out on an umbilical. So we actually supported them. They were our customer. Huh. And so we provided technical expertise on their suit. We tested their suit in our human-rated vacuum chambers, and we helped to train their astronauts to be ready. I will tell you, I was really, really nervous <laughs> when uh, they actually went out and did the spacewalk because, you know, space is hard and, and it was the first time. So a lot of things could have gone wrong, but it went uh, perfectly well. But those are the types of things that using all of the, the resources that are available will allow us to do more together. Yeah. That's pretty phenomenal and certainly is different than government-led, I think is the way I've heard it said in the past, where it truly is a partnership. It's truly a partnership. Amongst nations, amongst companies, amongst government entities. So with that, I'll ask the question of how's the transition gone? Um, and, you know, um, what types of policies... What have we learned, I guess, in the process? Because I, I can't imagine it's been easy to say, okay, we're going to hand over the keys to the car. We talked a little bit about a car, aging cars, that sort of thing. You know, um, what role does policy play in enabling these things? Yeah, I, I think, um, again, kind of having the, the policy and uh, saying that we are going to do these public-private partnerships, um, I... Um, I did a, a, a rotation as a part of uh, leadership development to NASA headquarters uh, back in the kind of early 2000s when we first started talking about uh, doing commercial you know, space. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a lot of concern as to, you know, well, what is that going to look like for the, the civil servants? And so helping and working uh, with the civil servants so that they could understand that the roles that we play today don't really significantly change, right? Okay. So again, as I mentioned, um, we still have to have readiness reviews. We still have to work with the commercial companies so that they understand that, um, you know, we're going to make sure that these vehicles are safe for our astronauts to get on board. And uh, so it requires us to have really close relationships with the companies 
as well as uh, making sure that our uh, workforce knows that they're still very valued because mm -hmm. they have 60-something uh, years yeah. <laughs> of yeah. expertise to be able to share. And so we have done that really well. Um, I will say, was it uh, easy right off the bat? Did we all get in the same room and we were all on the same page? No. Yeah. <laughs> it took uh, building that trust uh, and, and building that teamwork and, and keeping focused, uh, the, one, the one thing that uh, we all know is that we have the same mission. And so with having that same mission focus of people in space, home safely, yeah, it takes a lot of the turn out and it helps us to be able to get those things done. So, um, but having the policies, you, that was your, your question, but having the, the policies that we are gonna do this and it just, it sets a stake and it then says, okay, everybody's got to figure out how to go make this happen. What's fascinating to me, um, I do a lot of work in the commercial space world and all of the new things, all the new policies, the questions that are coming up. And, and, and I'm certainly not privy to so much of how NASA is integrating that in, but it's a different time, you know, and, and there's a lot of firsts that don't have a library to go to to look at how the best way to do those things might be. So it takes a lot of nimbleness, flexibility, um, creativity, and, and uh, probably... Uh, peace and grace in, in those processes. So I'd like to go, you know, leave Earth again, go past low Earth orbit, and let's go back to deep space. So and talk a little bit more about Artemis before I open it up for questions. But um, can you give us an update on the work of our, you know, of NASA, our international partners, our commercial companies, um, of where we are to put humans back on the moon? Okay. Uh, so um, as I mentioned in uh, 2022, uh, we did our first test flight of the Orion spacecraft, and that was the first time that we had a spacecraft uh, go uh, beyond low Earth orbit since uh, a, a human rated one since 1972, uh, since the end of Apollo. Yeah. And so now uh, what we're doing is we're building up for the crewed test flight. Uh, we named our Artemis II crew. Uh, they have been training and preparing for that mission. Uh, so. Out of that first mission, we learned some, some things that we needed to go uh, work on. We had to make some adjustments to not just, uh, when we launched it, we had some damage to the actual launch platform. Uh, we had the rocket itself um, actually didn't have a lot of anomalies, which was great for a first time of that rocket. And then the spacecraft, uh, we're working on uh, some uh, adjustments uh, to um, the, I would say right now today, when we did the first test, we didn't have humans on board. So we did mm. not have to have the environmental Big uh, difference. systems. <laughs> yeah. So now we're adding all those in. And then one of the things that we uh, also were doing was we were testing the heat shield. And we, are, we found uh, some concerns. And so now we're, we're working through tests to make sure that we feel confident that if we are able to, to launch with that particular heat shield, that we'll be able to withstand the environment to return to Earth. Uh, so we've been working towards that. Uh, we have a targeted date of 2025. Uh, and so what we're trying to see is where we are with closing all those things out before we can say we can commit to that. Uh, so lots of uh, testing that's happening, uh, a lot of training uh, that's going on to get us ready. So once we get through that milestone, what, that would be uh, the first time that we would have humans go into deep space since the end of Apollo. And then uh, what our next step is, is to land on the lunar surface. And so we have two uh, companies, uh, SpaceX uh, building Starship down in uh, South Texas. You guys uh, probably saw the phenomenal mm -hmm. test flight they had the other day of capturing their uh, booster. Uh, so they have a series of tests that they have to get through to actually have that capability ready. Um, okay. So several more tests that they need to do. Um, if, uh, if you've ever been down there uh, or, or not, you can actually um, go to uh, probably their website and learn a lot about what's going on in South Texas getting uh, that vehicle ready. 
so that would that right now uh, we have an agreement for them to be our uh, first demonstration mission. Okay. Uh, when I mentioned, we always want to have some redundancy. So we are working with um, Blue Origin. Uh, so they do some engine testing here in, in Texas, uh, but uh, they're building a lander as well. Uh, their lander design is a little bit behind um, where we are with, with SpaceX, but you know, in, in the space world, you never know who's gonna end up first, so we've got uh, some redundancy there. But those would be the two uh, ways for us to land on the moon. Uh, so when I mentioned that we're doing things differently this time, one of the other things that we're doing is we're building a small platform called the Gateway. Okay. And it's a, 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 it will be an orbital platform near the moon that will allow us to have human tended uh, capability. We'll be able to do uh, some um, experiments and research. Uh, most of it would be done autonomously because the plan would be for our astronauts to go and spend about 30 days. So they would go uh, on the Orion spacecraft to the gateway and transfer to one of these uh, landing systems, go down to the surface. We are currently uh, in um, building the gateway. We are testing the gateway. Uh, we have uh, elements uh, right now uh, that are being uh, designed and tested all around the world, mostly here in the U.S. Uh, for the early elements. And the internationals are going to build their parts to add to it. The, uh, as I mentioned, you, you, uh, that we have the landers that are being built tested. Uh, we have also um, been working with commercial companies that want to provide uh, rovers. So think about the moon buggy. Yeah. Uh, but this time it will have autonomous capability so that it can operate while uh, we're not there on the surface and it'll be able to operate, uh, you know, continuously. We have three companies that are designing, building, testing those rovers. Okay. Um, we also are working with our Japanese. They're building a larger capability for doing uh, surface mobility. Uh, oh, gosh, we have new wow. uh, suits that are being built and tested right here in Texas. There's a company, Axiom Space, that's building a new um, uh, it's called, uh, I'm going to say extravehicular activity. It's an acronym, EVA. EVA. And that, <laughs> yeah. so they're building that, that suit and um, they're well underway. Uh, we're doing uh, testing uh, in Houston in the chambers that I was telling you about. Uh, we will use our huge swimming pool for, for testing for, for Axiom. And then, um, Let's see, I'm leaving out something. Oh, we have the commercial lunar payload services. How can I leave right. that out? So we have robotic missions that we're sending uh, to, the, to the moon. And uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center uh, is responsible for uh, managing those missions. So we have uh, two upcoming missions, uh, one by a company called Firefly that's uh, based here in Austin. They have a mission coming up um, in the next uh, several months. And then we have a, a company called Intuitive Machines uh, in Houston. So they were the first commercial company to land um, on the, the lunar surface uh, earlier this year. Uh, and so um, there's just all of those things are in wow. work and it's all building. And, and, we, and I didn't really get to talk about all the people that are off doing mining and coming up with their designs and all of the infrastructure, you know, we're going to need to have... Um, you know, the ability for uh, communications. Yeah. So there's commercial companies that are building uh, communication services. Uh, we're going to have to have um, power. We're going to have to. So think about if you were building a, a small, let's say, um, RV park. That's how, I, that's how I like to describe it. Okay. If you're going to build a small RV park, what are I the fundamental relate. things that you need? You need a water hookup? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you want to have some way to have, um, you know, your Wi-Fi, you know, because that's now mandatory for all of us. And that's what we're going to have to have on the moon. And then you're going to have to have power. And so those are the, that, that basic kind of infrastructure. Those are the things also that are being worked on today. So I hear that, you know, why I go back to why I, I know how and I hear I don't know a lot about the technology because I'm not a technical person per se, but. We talk about going back to the moon this time to stay. Why? So we're How going, does that help Earth? Right. So we're going to the, to the south pole of the moon. 
through um, work that we have done uh, over the years, uh, we have strong evidence that there's um, ice or, or that we can take and we can actually use that uh, to have uh, water, oxygen, the things that we need for permanency. And so there's the science that is, is learned uh, on, on the moon. Yeah. It's a pristine environment and uh, if there are any uh, folks that are, are astrobiologists, um, we learn about our own earth by going there. And we also use and can use the things that we have there for um, what you know people ex expect to be, uh, especially the, the folks that are looking at it from a mining standpoint. Uh, they are looking at those resources being things that uh, will um, uh, provide them an economic benefit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the the other thing that we want to learn how to do from an exploration standpoint is learning to live on another body because then that will allow us to learn what we need to have to go to Mars, Got to it. be able to have the ability to do exploration there and to go deeper and deeper into the solar system. Yeah, great. No, that's yeah. awesome. So last question um, or thought on from me, and then I'm going to open it up for a few questions here before we end. So how can the state better support NASA overall, but particularly JSC. Yeah. We created the Texas Space Commission. The governor did. Um, you know, the, legis the legislation passed last year. Um, nine of us were appointed uh, to the board of directors in March. So we've just been at it a number of months at this point. We will have our strategic plan ready to go. We are about to have the form posted in the next week for public input to that strategic plan. Um, and we will present that uh, to the legislature before the end of this year. So how can Texas help JSC and NASA? Yeah, so Texas um, standing up a, a space commission and having a strategy for the entire state uh, is a huge benefit uh, to, to NASA, I'd say, you know, in general, but specific to NASA's Johnson Space Center, um, in order for us to accomplish all these great, wonderful things and plans that we have for Artemis, we need to have uh, an industrial base. We have to have companies that can actually um, perform yeah. and do all of these things. And it's not just like large companies or these space companies, but they're, um, anybody have a company that uh, produces valves? I will tell you, <laughs> yeah. that is, it seems to be our Achilles heel, uh, but it's, you know, those smaller things. Um, and a lot of uh, things I, you know, I think about like the, the space, the space suits, um, you know, you, somebody has to actually literally sew those suits. They're all yeah. hand sewn. These are not like mass, you know, produced in some big factory. Right. right? And so there's, there's smaller mom and pop companies that we need to have. Well, in order for those companies to actually make a, a, a business out of it, then they kind of need a little bit more economies of scale. So when we have more companies that are here in the state that are doing it, then that attracts us to having more smaller business that want to go into it. So then it just builds up that industrial base that we have, yeah. that we need to have. Um, I'm, you know, going back to the shuttle era, um, I will tell you, since then, our industrial base is not what it was at oh, that time. And so there's a lot of room and opportunity for, for growth and for expansion. So to me, I mean, I see that as one of the major benefits. And then the other big uh, um, benefit is, uh, again, so there's lots of opportunity, low Earth orbit, deep space, for many more companies to come up with whatever their bright idea is to to do something as a commercial company in space and so having this this larger i would say umbrella that's looking at how to help infuse um, whether or not it's resources or if it's helping with workforce how do we get more students to go into the fields that we need to be able to do these jobs and it's the four-year degrees, it's the technicians, sure. and then how do we connect and uh, make sure that the students that are coming out of these schools are going into these companies? I see all of those as benefits of having yeah. the Space Commission to help us to lay all of that out for the entire state so that we have a aerospace infrastructure. 
Thanks for that counsel, truly. I hadn't asked her that question, so that's good. Harvin, I promise I'll get to questions, but I'm not quite done, So, <laughs> and time is good. So my last question, I wanna go back to space workforce. Mm -hmm. First, how did you land at NASA, and what advice would you give to those that might be in the room or that they might take home to someone that's interested that really wanna follow your footsteps to a career at the Johnson Space Center? So I think, I landed at NASA um, in a, on a very interesting path. Uh, so, you know, as a young kid, I uh, was always just a curious kid. I just liked to figure things out. That was just kind of my thing. And first, I grew up in a small town in, in South Carolina. I didn't have uh, technology, high schools, and that kind of thing. So I literally did not know what an engineer was when I went off to college. And um, my, my big brother, uh, he was uh, then getting a chemical engineer degree, and he was like, Vanessa, I, I think you would be a, a good engineer. And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> 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 and uh, I found my true love. You know, somebody uh, earlier was telling me they were a space nerd, and I said, yeah, me too. Um, but I found, I just, you know, it was my, my passion. I just loved it. I got an um, undergraduate degree uh, from Clemson University in engineering. And uh, I actually was going to go to another university, I won't say, uh, to get my master's. And uh, then uh, Clemson stood up a bioengineering program. And that was really what I wanted to do. And uh, so I, I, I got my master's in bioengineering, went off to the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they needed to have engineers. They had, uh, at that time, um, medical device uh, uh, arm. Uh, so uh, lasers and ultrasound, different equipment was coming in and they needed to um, understand uh, the efficacy of it and whether or not it was safe. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I started uh, doing that job and it was a great job, I loved it. Uh, but I met a Texan ah. and, <laughs> <laughs> and he asked me to marry him. And I was like, gosh, I have to get a job. Yeah. And uh, so I was talking with my colleagues at the FDA, and uh, they were like, oh, well, maybe maybe NASA, but we don't know. I don't know. They, they were kind of poo-pooing going to NASA. And I said, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll go and apply. And, and uh, so I, I applied. Uh, I began my career in um, what was then called our Space and Life Sciences uh, Directed, yes. doing uh, experiments on astronauts, so learning how uh, the effects of microgravity uh, then using the space shuttle as a platform um, so that we could understand uh, the, the effects on the human as they go deeper and deeper into space. Uh, and so um, that's, that's how I got there. Um, and just curiosity kept me wanting to learn more, do more. Uh, I began uh, as a payload engineer working on like individual projects, helping external PI set up uh, their experiment designs and their, their testing of their hardware. Uh, and then being responsible for like suites of payloads that did that. Uh, then I moved to the space shuttle program uh, and started uh, working with external customers. Uh, at that time, there was a guy named uh, Jerry Griffin and his mm. brother had a company that came to, to visit me to, to ask about flying their payloads. I had no idea who he was. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, and um, so we used to prank each other a lot. And so, and so my, my uh, colleagues were like, oh, Vanessa, there's some guys coming uh, and they want to learn about flying stuff on the space shuttle. Can you go meet with them? And I said, okay, sure. So I go and I meet with these two gentlemen and told them all about how to fly on the space shuttle, what it was like to fly in space and da, 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 da. Then they tell me, oh gosh, that was a former center director. <laughs> I've never heard that story, seriously. <laughs> wow. Okay, then. But um, Shame on them. Yeah, well, and then... And uh, they were identical twins, too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but I um, learned to, uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. I became a manager of shuttle missions, missions that built the International Space Station. Uh, so I will tell you, the International Space Station flies over Texas. There's a, a, a app called uh, Find the ISS. I think it's called Find the ISS. And you can go outside in your backyard and you can see it. And so, you know, when I see the space station fly over, for me, it is kind of like seeing my baby flying over. Well, maybe not the same as a baby. But, <laughs> but um, 
but uh, then uh, moving to exploration, uh, working on our early missions for planning going to the moon, um, and uh, then so, our plans for going to the moon to Mars, working with the international community because our international partners, they've never been to the moon. Only the U.S. has been to the moon, right? And the rest of the world is so hungry, so very hungry. Interesting. Uh, and so uh, working with them on how they can play a role and what their part could be uh, was really very thrilling for me. And so now for us to be on uh, the cusp of us actually literally now having our crew uh, to do Artemis II mission, yeah, it's been phenomenal. So it sounds like Wow, you came to NASA thinking, well, I'll see what I might do in human life sciences, and now she's the center director. So obviously the path at NASA can be broad, and, uh, you know, so I guess the advice is go for it, try oh, it. Absolutely. I, you know, I'm sorry, you, you asked me advice, and, and I was, would say, you know, not just, you know, at NASA, but at whatever career field yeah. that you're in, you know, the one, the one constant uh, and advice that I, I received was, you know, whatever you're going to go do, be the best at it yeah. and uh, know that uh, whatever you're doing, if you're confident that you're doing your very best and you then will be recognized. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a straight path for me <laughs> to get into this chair by any means. Lots of twists and turns, many no's along the way, but... Um, just, uh, you know, stay in the course and yeah. knowing that uh, I, I had value, I had things that I could bring. Uh, and so where we are today, you know, like I said, um, having been a part of uh, all of the foundational things that we're working on today um, puts me in a very uh, good place to be able to lead my organization. Yeah. Uh, and and having gone through some some tough times, you know, right. having you know lost dear friends uh, in the Columbia accident, um, there's scars that you learn, but lessons that you learn that help you to be able to be successful going forward. That's great. All right, I know time is is wrapping up here. So questions from the audience. I'm gonna start over here. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I, I will say, I want to clarify that I would say that it's uh, right now today, we're, we're working to orchestrate um, both uh, NASA-led programs as well as uh, commercial capabilities and commercial-led uh, services. Uh, but uh, we, we um, especially where our astronauts are concerned, we um, have a responsibility to make sure that we are um, clearly um, staying up in tune, a part of, and um, where we're investing our dollars, uh, your dollars, <laughs> making sure that uh, we are um, doing the things that we need to do to make sure that those things are safe. So high risk, high reward. I think everything that we do every day is high risk. Um, and again, so, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, the Columbia uh, accident. Um, you know, there's not a day that we don't go to work and know that the things that we're doing are, are high risk. Um, uh, returning uh, astronauts on, you know, from, from space just the other day, um, you know, they're, they're landing, they have to land on a boat. There's lots of different things that, that, are, are, that are going on. Uh, so uh, having and making sure that we have workforce that is skilled, that knows their jobs, that is the investment that we're making today that will go and carry forward decades and decades later. And uh, so we, um, I would say, at, 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 at least at our, our center and, and most of the companies, and there's some companies that are represented here in the room, um, 
work, work, uh, uh, we work in teams. And all of the things that we do, we make sure that we, we um, transfer the knowledge from one generation to the next generation. So when I went uh, to NASA, I had a, a mentor and um, someone that I learned the ropes from. And so I make sure that when our fo new folks come in, they get the same thing. So that, that is really that transformation. That allows us to be able to transform, to do all the different things. But it's having that fun, those basic fundamentals. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me head right back here. So I'm a mayor Irving. I um, was the mayor of Pasadena, and I was very, very curious about a few things. One is um, back to the RV club for a moment. I'm still not clear about why we need RV club for a moment. I heard it explained that. Okay. No, those are really good questions. Um, let me, for the, for the first one, uh, and, and, and the reason I describe it, you know, in those terms, because I don't want people to think that we're like trying to have, I would say, you know, like a city and it's going to have, you know, street lights and all, kind, and all that, right? It's going to be bare bones infrastructure. And so the the research that would be uh, done on the on the surface is different than that would be done on this gateway platform that I that I told you about, um, but but a part of of um, the the research from a scientific discovery that we're still learning about uh, the moon, for example, um, with the the lunar rocks, you know. You, the geologists, other people take them and they understand like the basics beginning of our entire universe, right? So that's why they're studying them for that, for that purpose. So that's why going uh, to the surface. And then there's also uh, those that are looking at um, how do you take the actual resources and use those for economic benefit. So there's rare elements, things that are available that are not. That's that's why that. So I don't know if, if that's helping with the why of having a surface um, exploration versus orbital exploration. Now, your other point, which is exactly why I wanted to make sure that it was clear that you know we're not just going to have a bunch of people running around and nobody's in charge, right? There has to be somebody that's helping to orchestrate. And so, to, and it, so we use the International Space Station as a great, great, great um, uh, analog for that. Right now, today, the International Space Station, we, we manage that uh, consortium of all these countries through agreements that we have. And there's norms that we have to work with. But our flight control team and our flight directors are the ones that are in charge of, and they have the authority for making calls of what can and cannot happen. And so when we go to the moon, we're gonna have to have that same thing. And yes, we have a lot of discussions about that. And so before, you know, anybody, you know, which is a good thing that you're not gonna just get there on your own and you're not just gonna show up, right? <laughs> So, so before anybody gets going or doing anything, they're going to have to sign and say this is what they've agreed to because we do have to have those those norms in order for us to operate. I thank you. That was a really good question. I like to also say that you know resources here on Earth are finite, 
and we're not doing a great job as stewards of Earth in protecting those. And there are resources, particularly on the moon, like H3, helium-3, that can provide clean energy here on Earth. So I also think there's that benefit to Earth by being in space, not only in low Earth orbit for pharmaceuticals right. and others, but also lunar mining right. for, the, for Earth. Right. So, yeah, and one, one last other. question, we are out of time. So uh, Harvin, you came in with your hand up, I think. So um, please, I wanna make sure you get your question in. Okay, thanks. So uh, Director Weish, uh, your career path is incredibly inspiring and I recall that one of the two or three things NASA is supposed to do is to inspire the next generation as part of your mission statement or your vision. Um, and so, and then we remember the film, Hidden Figures, where people saw that, that not just astronauts, but all the other people that made it, you know, made it happen. Of course, those were engineers. Um, and uh, so what I'm wondering about is the rest of the workforce, because you mentioned workforce a lot, and um, I'm seeing, I'm wondering, we know that SpaceX can't find enough engineers in Texas, so they're importing them from California. That's fine, we love it. But um, or is there a role for, um, and we know also, but one last thing, of course, your work in STEM uh, NASA's work and your own personal work in STEM to develop more people that are interested in this and, and knowledgeable about that and then capable of getting those engineering positions in universities. Can our community colleges also buttress our efforts to broaden the involvement of people and then are there good examples of that? Uh, yeah. that you've seen? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question, Harvin. Um, and that's why I mentioned. Uh, so, yes. Uh, when I talk about building up the industrial base, it's our it's our workforce, it's the people, right? Nothing happens in space without there being the people on the ground, and so it is the you know the the four year degrees, the people that are the program managers, the designers, but somebody has to build the hardware, and those are the technicians, and uh, so our um, community colleges play a critical role, and that's the other thing for me why I got super excited when. Uh, the Space Commission got stood up because I saw what happened in Florida uh, when uh, they had all these commercial companies come in and then they started fighting over technicians and pulling from each other's companies, poaching, and it was not a good thing. And so to me, one of the other great benefits, and I, I know that the Space Commission has it as a part of their priorities, is around workforce. And so having that technical workforce to be able to support all these companies uh, is, is fundamental to everyone's success. And so that we don't have to fly people in from other states to be able to do those jobs because we got real good jobs right here in the state of Texas. So we need to make sure that our workforce, and, and it's that connectivity, right? You know, like I said, I, I came here, you know, I. Started in South Carolina, I was in DC, you know, I, I ended up in, in Texas. Having people know it is okay, you know, to move from Austin to, you know, to Houston or from Houston to, you know, wherever, you know, a, a little bit of mobility and, and maybe um, helping them uh, to be able to do that will allow, I mean, and then overall, it just makes more growth for all of us, right? Thank, thank you, you for asking a question. Please help me thank Vanessa Weich for being here today. Uh, and let's go to space and beyond. So thank you all very awesome. much. Well, I thank you. I thank y'all.